get involved at Metropole TVKE across all your social media platforms. 20146 is your SMS line. Hashtag business. Um, this morning, we asked the question, is Kenya on course to attain the 500,000 affordable units under the big four agenda? And joining us this morning to put this conversation into proper perspective and also talk about housing in Kenya in general. We are joined by the principal secretary, um, State Department for Housing and Urban Development, Charles Hinga Bonapiers. Good morning. Uh, good morning and uh, good morning to your viewers. We're happy to have you around, sir. Let's begin with that question because that's exactly what everybody really wants to hear on where we are on that specific aspect for the 500,000 units. Are we on course to achieving it, sir? Um, yeah, thank you uh, for having me uh, this morning. And uh, the answer to that uh, question is that yes, we are uh, right on our way. Uh, to achieving our targets, uh, but even more importantly, uh, we what we have done is to put in uh, measures um, and fix uh, what I will call a systemic problem, uh, because um, you can uh, imagine a country of 47 uh, plus million people uh, over 50 years since independence, and we've got less than 40,000 mortgages. Uh, that points to a systemic problem and the way you fix a systemic problem is not uh, through a quick fix is to make sure that you fix you actually diagnose what the problem is and you fix that and um, then uh, uh, you build on to that so uh, we the last two three years we have uh, uh, not only addressed uh, the major uh, uh, issues that have uh, bedeviled um, you know home ownership uh, and we have seen that the market has turned and we are seeing very good results as we speak pretty much but appears so let's talk about the reality really that is in the country even as we chart this conversation for the 500,000 affordable units now with the data that we have right now if you look at the average price of what an apartment would cost any person really wanting to buy it by themselves you have to go out by 11.58 million shillings and if you see where we've come from in the early 2000s, we were talking about 5.2 million. Meaning that even if we're talking about affordability, then data also indicates that you've got to talk about addressing it to reduce it to about 2 million shillings. That's exactly what's going to be affordable to a majority of Kenyans in the country. Is that a possibility under the plan that you have to achieve the affordable housing in the country? Absolutely, and that is uh, exactly what has happened. You know, the statistic that you've just quoted now, uh, that is based on a 2017 housing survey market. Yes. Um, and, uh, if you look right now, um, and uh, you, you, you don't even need to take any data that is coming from the ministry, uh, just take any Thursday newspaper and uh, flip through the property uh, section. And what you will find is that the majority of the houses uh, that are uh, being advertised for sale are actually below 3 million. They're around the 3 million mark. And so that in itself is a pointer that uh, the, the program is working because uh, while one uh, misnomer uh, of affordable housing was that government is going to go and build those houses. Um, you know, uh, afford affordable housing is not a, uh, just a um, an issue in Kenya. Uh, you know it is also one of the uh, even UN SDG goals um, and almost every country even when you go to the US uh, even when the uh, the presidential campaign that was going on one of the party manifestos was about prov provision of affordable housing because this is an, uh, an urbanization issue. Um, many people moving from rural areas coming to urban areas looking for greener pastures and more opportunities uh, but when they get there there is no uh, housing that is commensurate to their incomes and uh, because especially when people are starting um, you know the incomes are not that high so so you find that um, uh, what we define as affordable is uh, that you should not be able to you should not be spending more than 30% of your disposable income 
And so if you take that uh, majority of Kenyans, uh, especially uh, the, the uh, formerly employed, earn less than 50,000 shillings, uh, so you, if you work out your numbers, you'll, you'll come back to the number the figure that you just cited, that they can only afford uh, to rent or live uh, yes. on a home that is uh, less than 2 million or, or 3 million and below. And so that is one of the major achievements that we have done. And uh, to do that, we have had to tackle um, a lot of issues that have caused uh, ha the cost of housing in Kenya to be very high. For starters, uh, is the question of land. Uh, land in Kenya, especially if you come to uh, major urban areas like Nairobi, is the most expensive right now in the continent. And, uh, and largely is because people hold land in Kenya not for uh, development, but they're holding for speculative purposes. Uh, we've just finished doing a valuation role for the Nai Nairobi County. And uh, the last time we did a valuation role was 1980. And uh, an acre of land in Upper Hill in 1980 was going for 40,000 shillings. The other day, uh, in the papers, an acre of uh, uh, land in Upper Hill went for over a billion shillings. So um, it, it just shows you that you cannot have uh, the question of affordable housing and the most expensive land in the same equation. So part of what government has done is to identify land because we also as government hold uh, quite a huge chunk of uh, land on behalf of the public and we have released that at no cost to the end buyers, therefore uh, shaving over 40% uh, of the overall cost of housing. And the other thing was the cost of construction. Cost of construction also is very, very, very high. Uh, and again, this is uh, because of inefficiencies, uh, processes, tax regime, building code, there's so many other issues that have uh, led to very high cost of construction in Kenya relative to other markets. Uh, when uh, we began this particular program, uh, when we went out on untendered uh, for, uh, say, police housing, uh, the cost per square meter uh, was at about 80,000 per square meter. Today, we are down to about 35,000, so we've almost halved that cost. And uh, just recently in uh, Pangani, uh, the shell and core, uh, which is the, just the, the shell without the finishes or the housing, went for 22,000 uh, shillings per square meter. So the reality of the matter is, is that, um, as I said, you know, housing is, a, is, is extremely complex. It's a lot of money that you're talking about. A lot of things need to be in place. And uh, you just can't wake up and just start building the houses. And then lastly, is the issue of even if you build those houses, can the people be able to afford to buy those houses? So you must be able to balance between the supply side and the demand side uh, of housing. And I think that is part of what we have managed to tackle. Yes. Piers, let's move on to another data that is really going to put up conversation into perspective. When we look at urban residency, then you talk about 60% of urban residents actually dwelling in slums. And when we talk about then graduating these uh, residents into affordable housing, then you also look at about how many active mortgages that we have in the country. 22,000 active mortgages. So from what you said this morning, Bana Piers, when you have that number on your table, what could be your strategic plan around it, really, when it comes to affordable housing in the country? So that's a very good question, and um, uh, and it is indeed uh, very true that majority of our people in urban areas they live in informal settlements in slums. Uh, that is a fact. Uh, we it's we we are we have some of the most infamous uh, you know informal settlements in the continent, and uh, we would rank up up there uh, globally. Um, over time, what we have been trying to do um, uh, in the informal settlements is first of all to address. Uh, the issue of basic services um, and uh, that's why you see especially in the last couple of uh, months we have double our efforts on the opening up those informal settlements uh, you go to Mukuru, Kibera, uh, Kawangware, all those places in Nairobi we are now uh, improving on infrastructure we are providing them with water uh, they uh, per household uh, they pay more for water than myself uh, and any other person that lives in the, in the more affluent uh, areas of, of, of Nairobi, which is quite unfair because these are the lowest uh, income earners. Uh, and because, again, we have cartels that infiltrated that particular market. And that's why you see the likes of NMS 
have doubled down on provision of basic services. Uh, we are building toilets um, so that to ensure that uh, sanitation uh, is taken care of because again that goes to the heart of dignity uh, to the people and there is a program that we've been running which is called KISIP which is Kenya Informal Settlement Improvement Program which has really been focused on improving the infrastructure in this informal settlement. The reality of the matter is and I, I, I would like to challenge you to visit some of the informal settlements um, uh, and I was born in an informal settlement uh, in Nakuru and I had the privilege of visiting it um, the other day in Kaptembwa, uh, Kwaronda uh, side. And uh, it, you cannot call it informal settlement anymore. Because after we put up the infrastructure, we put street lighting, we put water, we put um, electricity into those homes, uh, into those areas, people actually ended up building decent housing. So the informality um, it, it naturally gets addressed. So that is number one. Now, coming back to the question about uh, ability to uh, buy uh, and afford, um, as I said uh, previously, is that this is a major challenge in the country. Um, and uh, as I said, there, is a there are many reasons as to why uh, we have got such low mortgages uh, in Kenya. In fact, the, we have one of the worst uh, ratio of uh, mortgages to GDP in the world. Um, so what have we done to tackle that one we have established uh, what we call a mortgage refinance uh, company uh, part of the reason why mortgages are um, uh, far in between in kenya is because of the way we finance them uh, financing is a factor of the cost of money and the tenure by at which uh, banks are supposed to lend uh, to the end users so you find that uh, the lending interest rates have been at the highest level 13 14 percent and the tenure has been short, which has been, says, on average, has been about seven years. So when you take 14% at seven years, and even if you take a three million house, uh, you find that the repayments are almost 50,000. Now, 50,000, you have taken out more than 70% uh, of uh, Kenyans uh, who can either own or rent um, a unit. And that's how a lot of people then end up living in the informal settlements. So we've addressed that by the, creating a mortgage refinance company, which is fully funded. Uh, we have we have uh, funded it uh, by four, about 40 billion shillings uh, for starters, and then after the 40 billion is replen is um, exhausted, we are going to go to the capital markets and raise more money because there's a lot of money that is available in the capital markets. What the refinance company does is that it 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 on lends money to the financial institutions because the most important thing uh, that we must bear in mind is that whatever solution you must come up with must be a solution that is sustainable and last for many years. Quick fixes uh, give us a good feel, but then we quickly um, you know, get sucked back into the systemic problem. So by creating a mortgage refinance company, we are providing cheap financing to banks at, say, about 5%, and then they are supposed to on-lend that money to end users at less than, uh, still using a single digit. Uh, that is a major achievement and has cut down uh, the repayment cost uh, massively. The other part is from seven years, we have almost doubled uh, or even tripled the tenure from seven years to up to 20 years uh, mortgages. This is the way you start addressing systemic issues by making sure that you have got systems uh, that are able to uh, address uh, the, the, the challenges. Yes, it's, it's interesting that you're actually mentioning on the Kenya Mortgage Refinancing Company because this was one of the biggest news under the affordable housing agenda in 2018. So can you talk to me so far? How has the performance been? How has the uptake been so far or the reaction towards uh, the Kenya Mortgage Refinancing Company, sir? So the way a refinancing company works, uh, is they are not, and, and I, I don't want to get too uh, into too technical details. So yes. uh, I'll, I'll try and really simplify it. Uh, the, the the way a, a mortgage refinance house works is that it uh, refinances primary lenders. So Kenya Mortgage Refinance Company will not um, will not finance uh, Hinga uh, as an individual. But it will refinance APSA Bank, for example, and then I will go to APSA Bank and, uh, and, and take a mortgage. That is why it's called a refinance company. And why is that important? 
the importance of a refinance company is that it frees up capital to ensure that the banks, when they lend, when they give me a mortgage, they take uh, my mortgage and offload it to KMRC, meaning that they recycle the same money and they are able to give that loan to somebody else. That is what uh, is the importance of Kenya Refinance Company, uh, Kenya Refinance Mortgage uh, Company. Yes. Now, the, the biggest achievement now is uh, that we have seen commitments. As we speak right now in writing from about eight participating banks, and I have not even touched circles, I have offers for mortgages for up to 338 billion shillings to Kenyans. So any Kenyan that want a mortgage now can walk into any one of those uh, participating banks and they will be able to get a mortgage for less than uh, 10% and um, uh, for less than 8% and, uh, uh, sing and single digits. So let's cross over to another bigger incentive in really trying to encourage Kenyans to take up housing in the country. Can you talk to us about the housing fund? How is it going so far and what sort of contribution have you seen so far from Kenyans towards the fund? So, um, as you recall, part of what we wanted to do with the housing fund was to undertake mass housing uh, production. Yes. Um, the, the total cost of uh, 500,000 housing is, uh, is going, was about, about 1.2 trillion shillings. And obviously, we uh, had to look for monies outside the main budget sources. Now, uh, because, you know, we don't want to compete with education, with healthcare, and all those other things that must be funded uh, from um, those sources. So therefore, what we had to do was to uh, look for a self-financing mechanism, and that's why we established the housing fund. What the housing fund was to do was to uh, almost act like a national uh, housing circle where everybody is contributing mandatory and voluntary. Our, our estimation at the time when we did the housing fund was we were going to be collecting about $9 billion a month. And with $9 billion a month coming in, we, were, we will have been able to tackle uh, and, and do mass production of housing because the land we already have, as we speak right now, I have over 15,000 acres of land across the country that is earmarked for affordable housing. Yes. So we were going to uh, invite uh, the developers to come and build houses for Kenyans and they don't have to worry about Wanjiko whether they will pay or they will not. The houses will be bought by the housing fund and then the housing fund was then going to on lend to Wanjiko at terms that are fair and are commensurate to Wanjiko's pocket. Yes. That was really the essence of the housing fund. Now, uh, we were, uh, there was a lot of litigation, there was a lot of noise, and uh, the, 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 the sad part about the housing fund is that the main protagonist and the people that uh, led uh, the choir for, uh, you know, um, you know uh, telling Kenyans to reject the housing fund, most of them, they own not one house, they own more than one, uh, I mean, not just one house, they own more than one house. And it is very, 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 very sad because it was a noble idea. And countries that have uh, been able to address the issue of affordable housing, for example, if you look at Singapore, that's exactly how they addressed uh, um, their issue of housing. They have a mandatory contribution, and theirs is very high. It's at 37%. 37% of your pay slip is deducted. Uh, 23 out of that 37% goes towards what is called a general account where you can be able to go and borrow and build a house. And yes. you pay at rates that are commensurate to your pocket. You go to Mexico, Brazil, Nigeria, um, all other places, that's, what, that's how they've established that. But, uh, you know, we are a litigious society. And uh, even though the courts had not uh, pronounced themselves, uh, we found ourselves just stuck. Uh, going to court, answering these, and in the papers and in the news, it was the main dominant issue. And so His Excellency, the President, in his wisdom, said, look, um, let's look for an alternative, an alternative uh, um, way. Uh, of course, it is going to slow down the pace at which we were going to uh, do the mass production of housing. And so we had to re-strategize. And now our strategy is let's support the private sector through tax incentives, 
through making land available, through helping um, uh, end user financing. And, uh, we, you know, obviously that was going to take a little bit of time because I'm not in control of the developer. Uh, but with the right incentives, and we have seen that the market has turned. Uh, now, currently the, market, the housing fund is voluntary. Uh, we have less than a billion shillings in there. Uh, but the interesting bit is that we have got on Bomayang, we have got over 320,000 Kenyans who are registered. We have about 30,000 of them who are contributing uh, something, whether it is uh, 1,000 or 200 shillings uh, per month or per day. Uh, we do have that. And we believe that as, as soon as all these supplies start coming together, we will see an uptake in the, in the, on the voluntary side. Yes. But yes, let's talk about the, 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 I would say, the agenda that you've already set, especially under the units that you've launched under the Boma Yangu Initiative. It is true that your critics are saying that, well, Kenyan market is unique. And we've seen exactly how you've said. We have one bedrooms, we have two bedrooms, we have three bedrooms, and we've seen the prices that these ones are going for. Question is going to be, is that the pace that you're setting for even the private uh, investors who are going to come into the country, that you can't be off from this? You've got to be in this region from the ones that we've already set off in the country. Uh, absolutely. And um, if you go to Bomayang, we do have uh, uh, a lot of private uh, listing, private yes. development listings yes. uh, currently. And I uh, can cite a few. And uh, in fact, yesterday there was another one that was just presented to my office. Uh, and the interesting part is, while we have put a cap uh, at, um, uh, on government land to be 50,000 per square meter and non-government land to be 60,000 per square meter, so in other words, that is the cost per square meter. So if you have a, 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 a 40 uh, square meter unit at 50,000, you should not pay more than 2 million. That is essentially what it means. Yes. Uh, what uh, I was presented mm -hmm. yesterday is actually at 46,000 per square meter by a private developer on private land. So the, the, the benchmark has been set, and that is why today, you know, just to simplify it for the viewers, is that when you take any newspaper um, that is where there is housing that are being advertised, you're seeing the average cost of the housing has gone down. Yes. And that is a fact. We are seeing it because People, when they apply for approvals, they go to National Construction Authority, they go to counties, and we are seeing increasingly that the number of houses and also to the lands uh, 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 ministry uh, where they are registering for uh, stamp duties, we are seeing that the number of houses in this band have tremendously increased. And that is why we are working on... Uh, uh, you know these um, uh, uh, these statistics, which we we are hoping that we are going to be able to produce them uh, in uh, not uh, so long uh, a time. People say that for us to achieve this five hundred thousand, that's a big feat. That we have to, I would say, radicalize and wait or look for a better and faster evolution in the way in which that we view real estate sector in our country. Just in point. Are we moving away from a case where even counties have their own modalities of land classification? Are we now harmonizing it? Where if I want to develop in county A, B, C, D, it's the same, same sort of harmonization that I'm going to find in Nairobi or elsewhere, sir? That's a very good uh, point that you make and question. Uh, and, and let me say that uh, the real magic uh, of uh, this affordable housing is actually what is happening at the county levels. Yes. And and again, as I said, and, um, uh, it's very, very, very important that you forget about everything I've said is that this is a process um, and, and it's, a, it's a systemic problem. Now, one of the things that we have managed to work with the counties because, uh, you remember, housing is a concurrent function. So it is both at national and a county level. Yes. And um, at the county levels, uh, we have over, over uh, uh, close to 40 counties that have uh, signed an MOU with us, uh, national government, uh, making a commitment that they are going to provide housing at that level. So the first thing that the counties had to do was uh, in their CIDP county investment development plans is, and, and their spatial development plans, is to identify where those houses are going to be built. Planning is very important. 
one of the reasons why we have so many problems, traffic problems, slums, and so on and so forth, is because this word planning, we threw it a long time ago. And it, it's, it's understandable uh, because um, the planning uh, aspect has been driven by politicians. But politicians have a defined term. In, in essence, what you're saying is that when you appoint, you elect me uh, to get into an office, uh, I am looking at my first five terms and I'm trying to do so many things within five, uh, five years. So what, what is the first thing that you throw out of the window? Is planning, because planning takes time. So you don't want to hear uh, issues of planners, or oh, let's uh, plan the settlements, uh, let's make sure we get the right investments, and so on and so forth. You just want to hit the ground and start, people want to see brick and mortar. Again, also we as a, as the, as a, as a population, I think that is what uh, we, we, we demand. We demand uh, almost uh, <laughs> for there to be uh, some you know, magicians where you get into office and you, you, you do magic. That does not happen. So what you find, therefore, is that there's been a lot of unplanned uh, developments. Uh, you build a road and then you plan later. Then you realize, hang on a second, that road is a road to nowhere. You, you, they, there's no, there are no people living there. And uh, you're, you're planning to build roads this side, but people are building houses on the other side. So where people are building uh, their houses, there are no roads. So essentially, you end up perpetuating and um, uh, in, uh, the, 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 the issue of the slums keep on growing. We are seeing a reverse of that. And, and that is why I say that uh, um, there has been an enormous amount of work uh, to fix a systemic problem. So, so counties now have got CIDPs, they have got their special, pla uh, their special plans, and therefore if an investor goes into Kitui County, for example, they will be able to be shown this is where the land that has been set aside for housing, this is land that has been set aside for manufacturing, and, and, and so on and so forth. So that is very, 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 very important. If you look um, increasingly the last couple of months, you've seen a lot of counties now uh, uh, getting now to construction of this housing once you do the planning. Uh, Kitui is a case in time, we have Kisumu, we have Morana, and so on and so forth. So we've got a lot of counties now uh, that are starting to uh, produce uh, this affordable housing. Very, 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 very important step towards addressing the issues of uh, affordable housing. Yes. Well, appears, I beg that we move on to the next part of our conversation. Let's talk about the coronavirus pandemic. And you like to think that from where you sit it, you do know that the real estate sector on which we are pegging uh, the affordable housing agenda has not been performing well. Now, one of those issues that critics have said is that for a long time, it's a city the government has been playing a passive role in the sector that you have been watching as opposed to participating. The coronavirus pandemic has hit again and the real estate sector was viewed as one of those non-defensive sectors where investors were saying hold on let things get better what is fueling your optimism that well despite the coronavirus pandemic and despite the way the economy has been hit that it's possible to get this 500,000 units are it's very easy to um, you know, to sit on uh, uh, on one side and just criticize. Um, first of all, let me just say that uh, when you have a global pandemic like uh, coronavirus, um, uh, a it, it 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 can catch you flat-footed, uh, and and two, uh, the, the the most affected areas um, in 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 um, in uh, when you get hit by a pandemic, say in the informal settlements. Uh, when you put out protocols, for example, when we started, uh, when Corona came to our shows, we said stay at home. How do you tell someone who uh, essentially lives from hand to mouth to uh, to be able uh, to um, yeah, to stay at home? Uh, and, and so you have a myriad of things that you have to do, and uh, uh, the decision making processes, uh, and 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 it's like life has thrown to you bad choices, and you have got to choose uh, some choices out of bad choices. Uh, that is that is really the the the, the issue about um, uh, pan uh, the pandemic. Now, the question though that you ask is why we are bullish about the real estate uh, and still why we think that uh, we we will still be able to meet our targets uh, for two reasons. Number one, when you have got an economic meltdown, 
uh, when you have an economic meltdown, our sector, the real estate sector, seem tends to be uh, one of the one of the ones that get hit first. Um, th that is that is the first problem that you have, and so we get affected very 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 fast. But once uh, it is also one of the sectors that gets out of a recession very 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 quickly. Why? Because um, uh, if you want to create jobs build houses because houses are, um, are, are labor intensive and they have got what we call a long uh, supply chain uh, so for example you have uh, um, uh, you have a uh, supply of cement uh, doors windows and you have logistics you have people working the secondary labor people who cook for the for the laborer so you you find that it is it is a good uh, part of the uh, you know, st stimulus package. And that is why we are putting a lot of emphasis and supporting this particular sector because it is not only going to help us to achieve our targets of uh, building affordable housing for Kenyans, but it is also going to create the right and requisite uh, type of jobs that we need right now because that we have been hemorrhaging jobs uh, since the uh, pandemic hit our shores. Another area that any investor may want to look in as well is the drive for Kenya to adopt new building technologies. Is our shift from what has been an old building code in the country also going to put a focus on the way in which the cost is going to be also a factor in a building of these units in the country? And have these incentives that we do know that you're giving to uh, private investors, the tax deductibility of expenditures for social structure, infrastructure, the tax deductibility for housing loans of up to 150% per annum, are they enough for people to overlook what would seem like our late shift to a new building code and new technology, sir? Yeah, yes, indeed, uh, that is the case. Um, and uh, just on the on the building code, um, uh, you know now we are um, we working on uh, changing that building code uh, because our code is as old as in the 1940s, uh, where we believe that you can only build permanent housing using stones. So we are moving away from that. We've seen a lot of new technologies coming in. Uh, what those technologies do? They reduce time. Time uh, once you cut time in term in terms of construction, you reduce the cost. Uh, they they also uh, use uh, some readily available material, uh, some also uh, highly mechanized. So you find that the cost, uh, the cost is is definitely coming down. We've seen the results, and uh, and again, as I say, uh, just take any newspaper uh, where they're advertising for houses, and you will see uh, that uh, the cost has significantly come down, and uh, that means that this program uh, is achieving the desired effects be able to access housing by just using their pension funds as well. What appears, how instrumental is this going to be for your push for more Kenyans to get access to affordable housing? It is very, very instrumental um, uh, because um, we have, first of all, to believe that it is, uh, we need to encourage uh, people to own their homes uh, in their early uh, early lives of their of the economic useful uh, what you call an economic useful life that is their working life yes there's no point of owning a home when you're in retirement uh, you need to you will first of all have lost on the opportunity for that house uh, growing in value and even maybe selling uh, that house get a bigger house out of what is called equity release uh, so we must encourage as many of the, our young people uh, to use their pension savings so that they can be able to buy a home. Secondly, uh, one of the most expensive, the biggest expense in retirement is rent. Uh, so therefore, if someone owned their own home, they it means in retirement they don't have to, um, uh, you know, uh, spend the little disposable income they get to pay rent. So again, that's why we are encouraging uh, the use of pension monies uh, for to, to towards this particular um, agenda. As we clear this conversation this morning, Mr. P.S., let me just take you to one of the questions that we have received from our viewers. And I'm just going to read it directly so you can be able to talk to them directly as well. Now saying, can you still join the housing fund? If so, how can one be a contributor? 
Yes, you can join uh, the housing fund. Um, you can go to bomayangu.go.ke. Uh, the registration is uh, pretty easy. You can visit one of the Huduma uh, centers. Uh, there's a USSD uh, which we can share with you and you can share with your team. Um, so there are many ways of joining the housing fund and uh, we are seeing uh, a lot more people uh, actually doing that. Pretty much. Thank you very much, sir, for taking your time this morning to speak to Metropole Television. It's been quite a privilege. Thank you so much and uh, good morning to your viewers. All right. On that note, we come to the end of our conversation this morning, taking back to the time that he came into the studio this morning at uh, Metropole TVKE across all your social media platforms. Also, any other questions that may have, 20146. My name is Simba Elijah Charles. Okay, okay.